the recipients of this money provide a business plan, which darn well better help them build one before you give them any money so they know every question out there that any one would ask before they loan their child money um, isn't there. Hi, welcome to the Duopoly Report. This is Steve Cavietas. I'm going to say something ahead of time before we get into this video. If you've never shared one of my videos ever before, uh, whether on Facebook or especially on YouTube, um, you know, I know all of us YouTubers are like, hey, remember to like that, hit the smash the like button, uh, subscribe and click that bell for notifications. And, you know, we always say that all the time, but I'm telling you, if you've never shared one of my videos before, this is one that you need to share. Because on June 29th, the city council met in an emergency session. Why an emergency session? But there was one uh, amendment for a million dollars to be given to the black community for um, to help them to uh, assess and figure out the best ways to distribute that money uh, to, in response to the COVID crisis and how it's affecting the black community, specifically in the city of Albuquerque. There was some uh, pretty astonishing debate that went on. And for this video, there's a whole lot of stuff that went on, but for this video, this one's focusing mainly on Trudy Jones and how her anti-blackness was unfurled in in just proud fashion on this night and uh you may have seen the the couple of clips that i put up at the front uh and there there's more but wait there's more and also i'm not going to let cynthia borrego off the hook uh completely uh in this video because uh she seemed to have uh like amnesia to the scale of 10 uh to on that night but I'm not going to talk completely about all of this. Uh, I have a special guest. Joining me now is Lauren Ruffin, co-CEO of Fractured Atlas and co-founder of Crux. Lauren, thank you for coming on the Duopoly Report tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve. So uh, I, when I watched the city council meeting last night, I saw you were the panel of three people. I was wondering if you could tell us more about that uh, allocation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we approached the council. Um, this was Charles Ashley's idea. He's the um, the board chair of the One Albuquerque Fund. Um, and we really came to them with, with a request that they um, allocate a million dollars um, that would be set aside for the Black community to be able to go through uh, to a co-creation process whereby we decided um, how we would use that to lift us up. Um, you know, nationally, we've seen that Black uh, business owners are, are really suffering because of the pandemic. There's some estimates that say, you know, upwards of 60% of black small business owners are going to go out of business due to the pandemic. Um, and so we wanted to sort of get a head start um, in asking the council to provide some funding for us to figure out um, how we can help our community. And that could look like education, it could look like housing, it could look like loans or grants to small business owners, technical assistance, um, but we really just wanted the commitment from the council. One thing that was mentioned is that like, uh, you didn't have specifics yet for the million dollars, that there was a different process that you might, you, that you're gonna try uh, as opposed to, as, like uh, I guess the city having this all laid out ahead of time. What is that process that you're gonna develop? Yeah, I, it really is a, an entirely new model. It's not a new model actually. Communities have been co-creating things forever. Um, and so it, it really is a community driven process whereby, um, you know, once the funds are, are committed, we then take the time to go to the community and ask them to do the work of determining how the money is going to be sent instead of asking them to do the labor um, of figuring that out without any sort of promise from the city. And I noticed that uh, besides Mr. Uh, Ashley, right, Mr. Mm -hmm. Charles Ashley from One Albuquerque uh, Fund, there was also uh, Ken Carson, uh, who I actually know, uh, who is the, the owner of the three Nexus breweries in town mm -hmm. um, and uh, a, a member of the community for a long time. Um, so it kind of floored me. Uh, we're going to run some clips here in a second. <laughs> I've got this one from from uh, Councillor Cynthia Borrego. I, I kind of feel like I don't know. And then who is the African-American community that is going to be receiving the funding? She seems she it seems like she's clueless to the African-American community in our city. Has that been your experience? I mean, it, it does seem that way. And, and again, I'm a relative newcomer to Albuquerque. Um, 
I was frankly astounded um, by the sort of openness and lack and lack of engagement with the black community. Um, you know, regardless of, of our numbers, black people have always had a ton of social capital, no matter where we are. Uh, we are economic drivers. So, um, you know, I was pretty astounded by that statement. Right. And uh, I was too considering that uh, there was a different part of the meeting where she, she seemed to be aware of. Well, well of to be clear, she said that she was one of the founders of was it United South Broadway? Yeah, it's not the community center. It was something else. She must have had some dealings before, but she was definitely playing clueless um, during that uh, section. But back to what I started with, which is our star of the night, City Councilor Trudy Jones from the oh-so-exclusive uh, uh, gated neighborhood. And she had i have i have three clips here two of which i showed at the very beginning of the of the video but uh, i want to rerun all three i'm going to start with the one that was the most shocking to me of, of all three of them and it's this one here the recipients of this money provide a business plan which darn well better help them build one before you give them any money so they know what they're doing when I saw this happening live and in person, I mean, my jaw dropped to me. This is what I, what it appeared to me, and then you can enlighten me with maybe your reaction. It was like she had this feeling that black people had never gotten money before. None of them know how to do business or know how to do accounting. And, and, and the phrasing of they better damn well, you know, they damn well better have a business plan if, if they want to be getting some money from us um, was just uh, condescending, uh, you know, to 11. <laughs> it, it got off the one to 10 and yeah. to 11. And what was your reactions while you were watching that live? I mean, I'm, I'm no longer surprised about these things. I've, I've raised, you know, over a hundred million dollars at this point in my career. Um, I've heard everything under the sun. So it's not surprising to me. Um, it's, it's, um, anti-blackness looks the same everywhere. Um, and it looks like comments like that, like questions like that. Um, when she's candidly speaking to, you know, three black business owners who control multiple millions of dollars in capital, um, much of which flows into this community. Um, you know, you mentioned Ken has three, three, um, breweries, um, Charles runs several businesses here in the community. Um, and you know, I run, you know, the equivalent of the, the ninth largest arts foundation in, in the United States. Um, so it's, you know, in terms of capital that we move from foundations to, um, to artists. And, and so, um, but, but that's the function of anti-blackness. It's to have us constantly have to ju justify ourselves um, and sort of justify our existence and, and debate our humanity, um, you know, in front of bodies like this. And, you know, luckily, I think Charles, Ken and I were able to keep our eye on the prize, which was, you know, let's, let's just let this woman dig herself a hole. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is what she did, um, because it became pretty clear that um, everybody else in the council knew what was happening. Um, and a number of her, her fellow council people um, called her on some of the unfairness of the questions she was asking. Right. I, I think that even some of her allies understood that, that her tack was not one that they were could or were even willing to take or had to explore new ways to express their opposition than the bald face way in which Ms. Jones did. I'm going to go to a second clip, which is similar it's it's in a similar vein people who make the decisions will it be business people will it be people who've been involved in lending who've been involved in starting businesses or helping businesses again when i'm when i'm hearing her say these things it's like she to me she's saying i don't know a single black person who knows how to who's been in lending i don't know a single black person who has had a business I don't know a single black person who knows how to build a business plan. I think they're just going to take the money and throw some dice in the alleyway to try to double up and uh, hand it out or something again. And well, and then as we spoke, Ken Carson is not only, mm -hmm. uh, he's not only the owner of the three Nexus breweries in Albuquerque prior to that, his career was the president of the bank of Belen. Mm -hmm. And he sat on the governor's, um, the governor's uh, banking commission for a number of years, five or four or five years. Um, and Ms. Councillor Jones apparently is absolutely clueless of any of this. This also surprises me because during the, um, during the debate over the sick leave uh, ordinance, the, the public vote that had a lot of back and forth and went 
back and forth in the council and had people. Um, Ken Carson was a business owner who was uh, pro sick leave and uh, was more visible than most business owners on this. So it was like a double amazement for me when I heard those words. Uh, your reaction? I mean, again, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, it's willful ignorance. Um, it's, it's really convenient to overlook all the qualified black people that you have um, in your community because it, it allows Ms. Jones to feel powerful and right. it allows her, it allows her to um, think that she's taking our agency away from us. And I mean, her, oh, oh go on. I, I, and I, I was just going to get to the third clip real quick. And I, I, I think it speaks to the anti-blackness that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but it, it was a final wrap up. I think it was in her second round of comments before they were going to vote on the amendment um, that she said this. And because somebody, I mean, sometimes when you're giving money to businesses and people who haven't done much business, there's obviously failure. It happens. It's not doesn't mean the program fails. It means that we need to know what's happening and maybe um, help encourage the adjustment of how the loans are made and what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. But what I, so what I'm seeing here from Councillor Jones is almost that she's expecting that these people, you know, since no black people ever have money or have a business, it's just of course going to fail, and she's going to need to write in and save this million dollars from being squandered. And is that not also kind of a an anti-blackness attitude as well? It's it's so it's so classically anti-black, um, in particular because we're talking about a million dollars. You know, it's it's not like this is money that it's going to save some businesses. It's going to make a difference in some lives. Um, but candidly, you know, black communities and I would add indigenous communities in Mexico are probably deserve more than that. Um, so the idea that um, in particular, um, we survive every day in the face of this. We don't need anyone to rescue us. We don't expect anyone to rescue us. And we've been rescuing ourselves for 400 years. Um, so I, I just think um, it's just it's so classic. It's, it's laughable. Um, and then I guess there was there was one other uh, there was one other particular uh, thing of note. What, what was yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the only aspect of um, of Miss Jones's commentary, questioning, whatever we want to call it, um, that really sort of took my breath away was you know her. I think it was her penultimate comment um, where she did a couple of things. Um, the the first being. Um, that that she essentially said that that black entrepreneurs need to be taught how to run businesses, um, and and for me, whenever whenever I hear that, I think about all of the the black folks I know who have been, you know, um, have had felonies that you know that they may or may not have deserved, but who then come out to start a business because they can't get hired anywhere, and um, so those are the small business entrepreneurs who you know we never think about, oh, yeah. um, but you know you have the dual impact of an unjust criminal justice system. Um, and that is then impacted by they can't qualify for any for any capital. Um, so they are they are literally making things up as they go. They don't need our help. Um, they don't need a business plan. Um, you know, I read something. Lena Dunham got pitched girls with a page and a half paper where she had no characters and no plot, and they gave her you know all the ability to build a, a show on HBO. Um, so when I look at that in one hand, I look at the number of questions we were asked yesterday. It's asinine. Um, the second thing that she did um, was. She in and she went on this rant about how she doesn't know anything. Um, you know, we didn't tell her anything. And there was a whole large conversation, some of, with her colleagues who said, This is actually the way the city does business. They're not asking for anything other than the way the city does business. That was said multiple times. Um, and so her inability to hear that um was startling to me. And the third thing she said was um that she's not asking the black community to do anything that a parent wouldn't wouldn't ask a child who was asking for a loan to do. And um creating a, making a statement that compares an entire black community when you have three black adults in the room um, to children is classic. I mean, that's not even anti-blackness. That's just, right. you know, bold, bright, italics, underlined racism. Um, and so uh, that that was what really took my breath away, that that last comment. And, and we've got the clip of that right here. It's like every question out there that anyone would ask before they loaned their child money, um, isn't there. Well, it did pass finally. The amendment passed eight to one with Trudy Jones being the only dissenting voice. Um, I, I noticed Borrego kind of like, you know, she didn't like saying yes, but she did. Uh, she, gave it, she gave it like a presidential signing statement, you know, like it was a whole thing. 
And uh, right, and then uh, and then uh, Brooke Basson voted yes. I guess after a, a provision was changed in the amendment, um, after doing a lot of the delay tactics that uh, Councillor Jones was doing as well. Um, I may get to that in another video. Um, but do you have any final words? Anything else that the the community is going to be up to in terms of this uh, million dollars, or is that still in process of working? I mean, I think the only thing I'd say is. Uh, you know, we're really looking forward to creating a model program for, you know, the potential for a partnership between, you know, city government and a local community that's really community driven, um, that gives um, uh, organizations and individuals and communities who typically aren't heard um, the opportunity to be centered um, in our plans um, and in our hopes and our dreams. So, um, you know, that, that's that's how I'll end, but it's it's an exciting moment um, and, and despite um, all of the comments that we, we faced yesterday, it's, it feels good to know that, that there was value to it. Yeah, I, I will also say that I, I give credit to um, Councilor Senna. Um, mm -hmm. I, well, there, there were six votes in uh, favor at the end, or no, eight votes in favor at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Six who I think were more solid votes. Um, uh, and particularly Councilors Pena and Senna, mm -hmm. who were who actually pushed back on on some of the comments that the other councilors made, which, by the way, I will tell you is unusual for a city council meeting. And so, I, you know, normally comments go without much everything. They councilors kind of allow each other to say whatever they're going to say. Um, and this time there were some direct responses back. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's because uh, especially Councillor Jones's uh, comments were just so egregiously out of line and I, I just wonder if there's some process to uh, have formal complaint or something yeah. on this I guess that's I, for other I've, people to explore I've thought about that I also think it was clear that some folks had done the reading um, of all the conversation we've been having nationally for the last four years um, and and people have been doing the work before that but it really sort of burst into the fore in the last the last several years um, so it's clear that that um, council uh, councilwoman uh, Santa and Pena had, had done that work um, and at least had started their own personal anti-racism journey. And I think um, it'd be great if the entire council um, spent some time sitting with that. Um, maybe a book club would be great. great. <laughs> so, so Lauren, any final closing comments before, uh, before you go? I know. You're no, busy. thanks. Thanks for having me, Steve. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Lauren Ruffin from co-CEO of Fractured Atlas and uh, co-founder of Crux. Thank you for being on the Duopoly Report tonight. All right, so my closing on this is this. We've talked about some of just the absolutely horrific anti-blackness that went on in the city council meeting that night. And the, I'm talking about the worst of the bunch. There was more. There was way more. And there's probably going to be another video that comes out about the slightly more subtle ways that some of the other city councilors expressed their anti-blackness that night. But um, I did want to leave with two clips from... Councillor uh, Lansena and, and the sponsor of the amendment, Councillor um, Clarissa Pena, um, which were actually much more positive and supportive uh, statements. And just leave us with that, those hints of positivity uh, for the evening. This has been the Duopoly Report. Thanks for tuning in. Part of that, but I just want to urge every everyone support. I think it's important. I don't think that you know there was a comment made about teaching teaching them, and I don't think we need to teach them anything. I think that we need to provide the support necessary so our black communities know and understand those inequities because they see it for themselves, and that they are the leaders that we should be looking to uh, where these investments go. And I, I trust that leadership.